Now this video is not going to be for everybody. Now this is going to seem really out there to a lot of people who haven't studied this stuff in depth and aren't this far along in their awakening because this is paradigm shattering stuff. This is about how far from reality we really are. How the world that we live in is almost nothing like what they have told us that it is. And the history of this place we live is almost nothing like the re-education camps have told us that it is. So if you have been on my channel and you've watched your stuff like this, Nephilim hybrids and all of this, five shocking things you never knew were in the Bible, or the whistleblower about what's going on in Antarctica, or any of these humanoid hybrids, or especially if you've watched like the giant in Afghanistan, or this uh, end time awakening about the giants and the contamination of the human gene pool and all of this type of thing. If you've watched these and you're like, oh, that's total BS and you know, you're out of your mind, you're a nutter, stuff like that, then this video most assuredly is not for you then you probably want to click off right now because this might do more harm than good for somebody who has not had these baby steps leading up to the realization of our history. But I would hope that you would continue your research and drink the baby's milk until you can eat the meat because this, this that I'm about to talk about, it's meat. And some of you will easily digest this because you're wide awake, but some of you cannot digest this, so you might want to wait. So I'm just going to start by talking about petrification, what petrification is. The process by which organic matter exposed to minerals over a long period of time is turned into stone, an organic object that has been turned to stone. So, you know, we think about when we think about fossils and stuff, a lot of times we think that they're just digging up actual bones. But these aren't bones, they're rocks, most of them. Of course, we dig up bones, no kidding. But I'm talking about petrified fossils. Petrified fossils are stone. They are organic matter, like these petrified trees or petrified animals that have been turned to stone, actual bodies that were turned to stone through this process of mineralization. So I just want to clear that up because I know people think that a lot of these archaeological expeditions that they're dealing with just, you know, bones, they're recovering actual, you know, some sort of organic matter, but that is not the case. These petrified fossils are stone. So think about what I'm saying before we move on to the next step. I'm talking about animals and people turned to stone. And I know some people are going to say, not people. People don't turn to stone because they can't be petrified. It takes millions and millions of years to petrify fossils. And even Bible believers may believe that it still takes thousands of years or millions of years because fossils are from dinosaurs, right? They're from the antediluvian world, which means the pre-flood world. But that's simply not the case. There are tons of examples. Here's a petrified leg inside a boot. Here's a petrified hat that was made of organic material, probably leather. Here's a fossilized hammer where the wood part of the hammer is partially coalified with quartz and calcite crystalline. But we'll start with this human leg because this human leg was found inside a boot, a boot that could be identified by the boot company that was from Texas that began manufacturing boots in 1936. So. It's impossible that this is billions of years old or millions of years old. And it's just like the hammer. Unless you think dinosaurs were using hammers, none of this makes sense. And that's what I always say about mysteries and anomalies. There are no mysteries and anomalies. The truth is right in front of our faces. When you say the word anomaly, that means evidence to the contrary. So if something doesn't fit, the the narrative the official narrative if something doesn't fit the official version the official theory that they're they're shoving down our throats in the re-education camps then it's not an anomaly because it doesn't fit it's evidence that the theory is incorrect because science incorporates all data to come up with a theory a hypothesis you can't just take data that doesn't fit your theory and go oh that's an anomaly it's a mystery no, it's evidence. 
It's evidence and it's science that proves that this paradigm we have been taught that we are living in is inaccurate. Like here, this fossilized hat, <laughs> they make a little quip, is this a caveman's hard hat? You know, no, of course not. This is a modern hat and yet it is petrified. It is made of stone now. Likewise, this human leg that was found inside this boot, obviously the rest of the body is broken off through erosion and it's probably in pieces all around that we just perceive as rocks. But this boot has been through CAT scans and MRIs and has been tested and all of it, there is a complete human foot and part of a leg in here. And now it is limestone. It is just a rock, but it is a petrified fossil. So this, the CAT scans and stuff were performed at Harris Methodist Hospital in Bedford, Texas on July 24th of 1997. This gives all of the technicians names and all of this information. I'll put the links below so that this is in a museum. All of the scans are in the museum, the foot and, and leg and the boot, all of it. It's in the museum so you can go see it for yourself. I'll put all those links below. And here's another one. Here is a finger, a fossilized human finger that has been found. They have dissected it. It has also been replaced with limestone. They have done all of the CAT scans, x-rays, MRIs on it in Oklahoma. All of this information again will be below in the links. And I specifically bring up this finger because it looks like a stone. Stones that we see all around us all the time. Smooth stones. And this will lead to some research that I'm going to get into here in a minute with a gentleman who calls things no toes. He calls stones no toes. And that's because these digits, once they're petrified, they break off. He deals a lot with the petrified fossils of human feet and hands and things like that that are unrecognizable to us because the digits are break off so easily. So again, you can see, you know, this, could, if you didn't know what you were looking for, you could see how this could be mistaken for just a, an oval stone. And it is a stone, but it was also a human finger. These are all pictures of the petrified forest. And, you know, we've all heard of that. We don't talk much about petrified humans or petrified animals, but we do talk about the petrified forest quite a bit. So let's look at a couple of these pictures. And again, some of these are monstrous, absolutely monstrous in size. So, you know, at first glance, this looks like some strange rock formation, but of course now we know these were giant trees and you see all these little stones around it from the erosion and little pieces being broken off and stuff over decades and centuries and millennia. So we have all of these smaller stones that are part of the landscape and we just assume those are rocks, like rocks just always were rocks. But those, even though they don't look like trees because they're broken into little pieces, those are all little pieces of these trees from this petrified forest that have been broken and scattered over all the, the centuries and millennia. And there are petrified forests everywhere, not just in America. Here's one picture of a petrified forest and you can see the types of stone. They, so when we see petrification, there's all, all different types of stone. Things turn into all different types of stone, not just limestone. It just depends on the conditions, you know, the water levels, the amount of time, what type of sediment and minerals were in the sediment around that covered these things. So you can see these, these, these petrified trees look much different than the ones in Arizona. So let's look at this one. So we just say, oh, here's this mysterious rock sitting here in the middle of nowhere. But what if this stone, what if this was something petrified? Not a tree, but organic matter that petrified. I mean, look at it. It, it looks similar to a sphinx. Now, I know that might be a stretch, but I just wanted to kind of slowly bring you into what I'm about to tell you. The Great Awakening is here. But the Great Awakening is about far, far more than just politics and QAnon and the cabal and all of that. I just wanted to put this picture of these dinosaur bones up so you guys can keep this in mind as you start viewing these pictures I'm about to show you. Because some of these quote unquote rocks are enormous and it's hard to wrap your mind around it. And although the Vatican and the Smithsonian have secreted away much uh, much of the evidence and have created this false narrative to explain what these things are that we see with our own eyes. Um, at least I think we can all agree at this point that they did exist, that dinosaurs did exist, that giants, giant creatures once inhabited this place we call Earth. The Bible calls it the antediluvian age, the pre-flood era, 
the first earth age. And I bring that up not to be religious, because the presence of water is key. Water, pressure, temperature, weight, enormous amounts of sediment covering these creatures all at once, suddenly, things like that are very important to understand the fossilization process, the petrification process, and that it does not take millions or billions of years. And water is also important because the presence of water completely messes up our entire carbon dating process. So anyway, let's get to it. Let's get started. Let's look at some of these pictures and um, hopefully you'll see that the entire earth is covered, just sprinkled over every continent. These quote unquote rocks that look exactly like huge animals and creatures. And we just climb on them and walk around them and go to the beach and take our picture with them. And, and the scientists tell us, isn't that odd? What a coincidence. Look what nature does. The geology just somehow naturally forms all of these stones all around us, everywhere we look, all around us. We see skulls and faces and feet and hands and animals and everything else in the rocks all around us. And we're just told to ignore it. Don't look around you. If you look around you, isn't it amazing that geology just naturally makes it look like the ground and the rocks are made up of creatures. But I'm here to show you guys that geology was once biology.
I think I want to interrupt the slideshow right here because this picture reminds me of Beaver Ridge and the Native American legend around that was that the, the ridge itself was part of an, a giant ancient beaver, a petrified beaver, and that there was a living giant humanoid in the area that they had to appease. And at some point they had a falling out with him and they said that he cut off their water source by stepping on their creek and damming it up. Now in our modern paradigm, that's, that seems impossible. It must just be mythology or legend, but they said it really happened in ancient times. And so I thought that was interesting in light of these, these things that we see like giant petrified beavers and lakes shaped like giant footprints. Now, before we go on to the next level, I want to stop and touch on the science behind this, the CAT scans, the MRIs, the DNA tests, all of the, the geology work and the anatomy work that is being done in this field. Because a lot of people will say, oh, they're just rocks. Like we're just wild eyed, you know, conspiracy theorists that they don't study science and there's nothing further from the truth. This is being suppressed. This evidence has been, Roger took this to Yale University and other places. It's being actively suppressed, but there is science behind it. So I'm just gonna show a, a couple of quick clips from Roger at Mud Fossils University. And he will talk about how the mud fossils line up with anatomy, the geology compared to anatomy and all of the things with veins being veins. <laughs> when we find veins in these stone that they're actually veins and things like that. Uh, now I know this is elementary. This is mud fossils 101. And a lot of people think I'm moving too slow, but I'm trying to create a tool to reason with people that have never been exposed to this type of thing. There's a huge communication gap and you know, you can't just like blast people in the face with this out of the blue and expect them to understand because in their paradigm, they're, they're living in a totally different world. So although I had to start way at the beginning and talk about petrification and all of these things, if you've studied this for a long time, then please forgive that and understand that this is a tool. And and hopefully for those of you who are seeing this for the first time, this will help build a foundation so that you can receive it. Because, you know, sometimes you have to offer people a sip of water on their journey and you can't just take a fire hose and blast them in the face. You have to give it to them where they can digest it. So hopefully that's what I'm doing. And for those of you who have studied this a long time, I'm sorry that it seems to be going slow. This is just scratching the surface on the research and the images. So the go-to guys on that would be Roger at Mud Fossils University. That You can find him on YouTube, Facebook, anything like that. Age of Disclosure has a ton of images and good work. And Dictionary of Truth is doing some fantastic work right now. So check all of them out. You can find them on YouTube. So we haven't even gotten to any of the really interesting or shocking stuff yet, but let's touch on some of the science. So we'll clear up some of the questions before we tackle this deeper stuff. So these next few clips are from Roger Spur of Mud Fossils University. All right, anybody that's ever paid attention to the mud fossils knows that I talk about the veins and the arteries all the time. Now, your artery will come down with fresh red, 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 red blood. And it has oxygen in it. And it pumps it down, pumps it down, pumps it down. And it, it, it goes through all these little blood vessels and it comes out the other side of the vein and gets sucked back up and, and back, goes back up to get more oxygen. And that is, and, the, and you see this side goes, they, like they tanned them up here. See, there's two that get pumped in and there's two that go, come back. There's two that get pumped in and there's two that come back. Now. You see all these little tiny dots out here? That's the ends, that's where they stop. And all, there's a whole bunch of little tiny holes and they go across. And here's what does happen. At the very end, this is a distal phalanges fingertip, exactly like you have here, only it's been deteriorated. And I have another one here that is not deteriorated. These are from giants and it's just what they are. Now, and, and, and this one was the same thing. It didn't blow out at the end like this one did this one is more deteriorated and it blew out from you see those two sides there you see that's the um that is the arterial side it blows out because the arteries don't have any clamps and they it tries to push the blood and they blow out there and out the end it's the same exact thing as you see here now the other side the vein side doesn't because that's being slurped back up 
to the heart and they close off here. See the clamp? They clamp off here. See right there. And, and the other one is up here. Same as they have here, exactly identical, no difference. No, you see that black thing right there? That's what's called a distal phalanges bone, the tip of the bone. And that is right in the tip of your finger, that's what it is. No, uh, and that's the pattern that it makes when the bone bleeds out. And uh, that's called, uh, you know, it's a, it's a ferrous oxide that bleeds out, bleeds out through stuff, just like this is bleeding out. This is a ferrous oxide to iron. It bleeds out through the tissues in the, uh, in the um, wood, same as it bleeds out in the tissues in this. And this is a, um, a mud fossil kidney. And you can see all of the same articulations. You see these boom, 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 boom. They have the exact same things, but you can't see them as well. See them? Boom, 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 boom. Same things. It's, in, in the mud fossils, they are so far superior to, the, uh, to what they're using for anatomical models. It's amazing. Anyway, um, let me show you some other stuff. Okay, this is an opalized heart. And these are the little heart strings of the heart and all the different ventricle walls and everything. Now, you see all these different colors. You see that blue extends all the way around there? That just not ha happen by accident. That tissue wants to have a transition metal to stabilize, which causes it to be blue. And, and I can show you the transition metals, and I will in a second. But all right, this is the thing they don't understand well. The carboxylation uses these transition metals to drive things around your body and deliver uh, oxygen and, and pick up carbon dioxide and glucose and do all the different things that they do to provide your body with nutrients and minerals and and, um, and, and flush it of, of the bad stuff. And that's what's in your blood. And these have to be there in the correct amounts and they are mined by the bacteria that's in your body. That's how it works. They create enzymes of bacteria and the enzymes seek out these so anyway, I don't have time to put the all of his research right here, but he goes on to explain all about transition metals and the ion colors and how we get these veins, literal veins of amethyst, veins of gold, veins of silver, how these transition metals actually settle out during this petrification process and this mineralization process and all of this and it produces all of these colors that we see in the stones around us. And we mine them. We mine these stones and we act like we t we even call them veins. Oh, it's a vein of gold. They found a huge vein of gold, veins of silver, you know. Obviously, part of our subconscious re remembers this because we call them veins. And they are literal veins. You see that? That's from the transition metals that are in some of these uh, specimens that I'm testing. We're, we're running through uh, with the microscopes, and and, uh, and this is what we're seeing inside it. Now, now that's this blood. The black is the vein blood. The red is the uh, arterial blood. That's the, the blood supply. And then you have your transition metals, and there's there's gold in here. There's gold, and there's all kinds of different. Uh, it's called electrum. Uh, and, um, and that's what we're finding in these, in, in certain areas. I mean, you don't see them everywhere. Call it the grip skin. Now, this is very, very transitional. You can see, and it's turned into like crystal. Now, this one has not transitioned as much. And this one has the grip skin. And it's, it's still fabric. You see that? These little white fibers. That's, that's, um, they call that uh, keratins, keratins. And they're little fibers that are in what they call the grip skin. And that's the, the tough skin on your fingers and your feet and your toes and on the bottom, the real tough stuff. And this one here has it as well, but you can barely see it. You see there's a pop. By the way, everybody asks about the uh, DNA report and it's right here. And um, if you go in, it will tell all about the, there's three specimens we had tested. And it's ve it tells all about how they did the uh, extraction and the, um, um, you know, all of the different things. They had to put it in certain conditions and this and that. And everything was done very, very, very textbook. You know, deep inside samples, nothing right on the surface. Uh, all kinds of negative controls checked out, no problems. All the negative controls came out negative. 
um, and and it goes down, no, 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 no. So that's that's what we got as far as that goes. Now, uh, then on, um, it, it, I have a uh, lab report. When I, I talked to the lab here too. Boy, usually 100 to 200 tops because the DNA is so fragmented because of just the, you know, the degradation. This is know, a couple the, of years uh, you know, ago. The years of, you know, wear and tear and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But I was able now, this to, is a big you know, toe I'm going to show it that. That uh, the that's a one. success with and that seemed like the best option and the, you know, another one. DNA primer that will essentially amplify all types of that's a so, you know, not just human, but any kind of, kind of vertebrate life form. So and that's so, a, so a they're rock, sort of a universal type of fit for Tendon. these samples, because we don't know, obviously, what the samples consist of. So, Boom. the you know, the sequence that came back, and it was roughly, you know, Boom. for each of these fragments, about 100 base pairs matched them up in the uh, database. It's in order to and they matched with the, you know, the human mitochondrial. There's two regions. Oh. Of the mitochondria, one is called the D, like the letter D, the dog, the D oh. loop, and then the other one I believe is for cytochrome B Thank gene. Uh, the mitochondria has several different genes that it uh, consists of, but these uh, these primers were specific for those areas of the mitochondrial genome. So um, yeah, so I you know it, you know considering where we you know started a couple months ago, that that's uh, you know. Those are nice results to have. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. That's that was the lab. Now that's a lung right there. You see that? That's the pleura they call it of the lung. The ancients used to call it tunica. It wraps your lung, and then you get down into the lobes of the lung. See how it's it's already red down there. It's just they, they're everywhere, and they're just not. They just they just can't get their eyes open, and they can't get their minds open, and they they just can't look. So they just ignore it because they're afraid of the result. And the result is going to be kind of devastating for them because they won't pay any attention to this. That just shows how close their minds are. So it's up to them. It's up to you. Have a nice day. So like I've talked about before in a lot of other videos, we have a ton of problems with the geological column. There's, we have built error upon error upon error, or maybe deception upon deception and lie upon lie to get to this place where we have a total misconception of world history and a total misconception of geology. At its core, what the rocks actually are, what the earth is actually made of. Starting with the geological column, they use circular thinking. So they have titled all of the layers of sediment and all of the layers of rock as different ages in the geological column. And they date those layers by the organisms found in them. And then they date the organisms by the layer that they were found in. So how, that's circular thinking, that's not science. You can't say, oh, I know how old this organism is because it was found in this layer. And then say, oh, but I, I only know how old that layer is because of this organism I found in it. It's illogical, but we don't have free thought. We're just given a chart. Everybody who goes through the re-education camps are just given this chart and this picture, and it's ingrained in their mind, and this is what it is. But it's not science. There's just one tiny example of that type of thing when we're talking about stalagmites and stalactites. Some geology textbooks tell us that stalagmites and stalactites form at a rate of a thousand years per cubic inch. Think about that. 1,000 years to get one inch. So then they use that false supposition to say, oh, we can date what these, you know, these caves are and how long this, that, and the other. And it's all fake. None of it's true because right here is evidence. This is, this is in Vincennes, Indiana. Here are tons of stalagmites and stalactites that are found in a building that is only 40 years old. So in this basement, we have, here's an 11 foot column. There are five columns that are 11 feet tall. And no, they did not form over, I don't know how many inches is that an 11 feet times a thousand years per inch. No, this is only a 40 year old building and this is in its basement and these columns formed. Again, all of the pictures and all of this information will be in the links below. But my point is, much of what we've been taught in geology is completely false. 
It's just supposition that has been disproven over and over again. So with this as a basis, now I want to go on and talk about what I'm really here to talk about. And this is Hill of the Skull, Calvary. This is what the Bible records. The Bible records it as the Hill of the Skull, Calvary, where Christ was crucified. Here are just a couple of those Bible verses. Matthew 27, 33, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And then Luke 23, 27 through 33, the actual verse is Luke 23, 33, and that's all the way down here at the bottom. And this is all about all the people following Jesus and mourning and wailing for him as they were getting ready to kill him. And then the very last verse down here in 33, when they came to a place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right side and the other on his left. In the book of Enoch, chapter seven, he records that there were giants in the world 3,000 L's tall, 3,000 L's tall. Okay, so if you translate that, a lot of people, because that's just too much, they're like, okay, that's too much. There must be some mistranslation. So they, they dumb it down and they're like, they come up with other ways and they rationalize. And they're like, okay, it's, four, it's just 450 feet, as if that's better, a 450 foot person. But if we just take it literally, like we're meant to take all of the, the scriptures literally, an L is an old English measurement equivalent to 45 inches. If this was indeed the measurement, then that would make the giants just short of two miles high. Think about that. Now that seems hard to believe, but look at the pictures I just showed you and then I'm gonna show you a multitude more of these mud fossils, these giants, two miles high. Enoch is referenced in the Bible repeatedly, and it's stated that he was one of the greatest men that ever walked the earth, closer to God than any other man. In fact, it's said that he didn't see death, that he didn't bodily die, that when his mission was completed, God took him up. Right here, it says in Genesis 5:24. so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. So right down here in Jude 114, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, also prophesied about them. And it talk, so it talks about Enoch being a prophet. It talks about Enoch being very close with God. And so we have the book of Enoch. And it's important to note that we're talking about someone very close to the creation of humankind, of the Hebrew race, the human race. So Enoch was only the seventh generation from Adam, and Enoch was Noah's great, great, great grandfather. And another thing to note that we've often taken for mythology is the ages, the age ranges, because we're taught about the, you know, it's progressive evolution, that things are getting better and better. At the same time that they contradict themselves and teach us that the world's in a state of entropy you know completely contradictory statements we're progressively evolving matter is progressively evolving oh matter is in a state of entropy that everything breaks down and decays and rusts and breaks down well we know which is true clearly the world is in a state of entropy 
which brings me back to the age thing. We're taught, oh, look how, how far we've progressed. We're living 70 and 80 years. <laughs> no, we are fallen. The human gene pool is contaminated. And it's just like a, everybody's in a state of progeria, which is that disease that causes uh, advanced aging, very rapid aging. And that's, that's what's happening to us. But, but back in the beginning, the Bible records that lifespans were 800, 900, 1,000 years. And it was very common like this, 300, 400 years. And that's not mythology. That's our misunderstanding. It's our ego. It's our egocentric sort of philosophy that, oh, we must be the pinnacle of something. We look what, you know, look what we've achieved and where we are. And we cannot accept the fact that no, we are fallen. We are a fallen race and this world's going to hell in a handbasket. But anyway, my point is that the book of Enoch should, although it's not canon, it should not be disregarded. It's not only historic records. It's also coming from one of the, one of the humans who walked the closest with God. And this is what he tells us openly. He tells us what the antediluvian world was like in those days. And all we have to do to confirm it is look around. Just look around, open your eyes and look at the landscape. Look at the mountains, look at the rocks. Just look around. Everything around us confirms it. It's true. The Bible is true. And this really isn't a new idea. You could see back in the 1500s and 1600s, 1700s especially, they did a lot of anthropomorphic landscape art, which is showing exactly what we're talking about.
and don't think for a second that the elites, that the cabal, the hidden hand doesn't know all about this. Because look at the Noah movie. You want to talk predictive programming? Look at the Noah movie. Remember the rock monsters? They go through, I wish I could put the whole trailer on here. I'd love to play it. Just uh, search rock monsters, Noah movie trailer. And it tells the whole story. It talks about them coming to earth as, as light beings, beings of light. But God got upset with them. And so they were fallen and they were bound in these rock in the mineral kingdom. And God, no matter how much they begged him, wouldn't let them out. And just all of this kind of stuff that we talk about, the fallen angels coming and all of this antediluvian anti world that is recorded in the records of every culture on planet earth. And apparently, you know, even though we know that the Vatican secreted away all of the historical records they could during the crusades and all of that, and the Smithsonian has done the same, obviously the mystery schools have passed this knowledge down to, you know, through these secret societies, because here we have this Noah movie. And when it came out, most Christians were like, what on earth is that? That's not biblical. Where would they have ever gotten that? But in light of what we're talking about here today, clearly, clearly they know something we don't know. Clearly they have retained this knowledge from ancient times and they have passed it down through their mystery schools. But of course, in the Noah movie, they flipped it around like they always do to make it backwards. And they made these watchers, the 200 watchers in Enoch were the fallen angels. But they made the watchers here, these rock monsters, out to be these poor good guys. And that it was the evil humans who had ruined the earth. Remember, Noah was pondering, should he even try to save his family? Because it was all the evil humans that needed to be wiped off the earth. But the watchers, the monsters, they were good. So the general theory amongst people following this research is just like this video says, the earth is a carcass of dead creatures, that the ground was alive. There are, there are things that are still part of ancient history that are part of the records we have from our ancestors. And then there are practices that we have that seem to be part of the human collective sort of subconscious. And we're like, where did those come from? And so let's talk about a few of those. We have this notion of Gaia, that Earth itself is alive, that the Earth is alive, that it's a living organism. And what are the stars and what are the planets, really? And Roger seems to agree. He goes so far to suggest in some of his work that large swaths of land can be identified as things like fallopian tubes. And, and he can watch, you know, mitochondrial DNA and things like that found in the land of the Earth itself. And many of the flat earth researchers, they find as they research that out and they go down that rabbit hole, they come out at those ancient records, the ancient records that say the earth is a, is some sort of being, usually a tortoise, and that the, the earth isn't a globe, that it's an animal or some sort of living creature. 
and then if we realize that these transition metals in the body can give us these beautifully colored stones and veins of silver and gold and things like that, it makes you wonder, is it a coincidence that this new age movement, this occult movement has taught their followers to take pieces of these fallen ones to take stones and they always use crystals and stones in their meditation and they tune into those frequencies of those bodies of those fallen ones which goes back to the same warnings of the ancient biblical times which is one of God's top ten it's in the Ten Commandments not to worship these idols it, it was always talking about the Bible is always talking about these gods of stone, these idols and gods of stone, and that they're dead and gone. Don't worship them, these idols of stone. And it's like, why? It's like, what's the big deal? Who believes a stone is anything? But in light of what we're talking about here, it makes sense. And to see that tradition carried on in the New Age movement, that they use these stones. They use these stones for their meditation. They worship with these stones. And the Bible mentions it too, so there must be some truth to that whole stone thing because the Bible talked about before Christ came and gave us his Holy Spirit so that we could communicate with God again, that the priests of the Old Testament would take a breastplate and they would put 12 different of these gemstones in it to create a harmonic and they would put this breastplate on and that would help bridge the gap you know from that excommunication that we inherited through the contamination of the gene pool that's what they used before Christ came so there's some truth to this frequency thing that is going on with the gemstones Caught in the crossfire. It's caught in the crossfire.